Welcome back to The Deep Dive. Today we are uh, really digging into the newest Ubuntu release, 25.7. It's got this interesting code name, Oracular Oriole. And that name, Oracular, well, it makes you think, doesn't it? Prophecy, seeing the future. But why should you, our listener, really pay attention to what seems like just an intermediate release? You know, it's not an LTS, no five-year support window. Yeah, that's a fair question. But it's actually because it's not the long-term support version that's so, well, crucial. Think of these non-LTS releases as Canonical's um, main testing ground. Ah, okay, like a preview. Exactly. If you want the inside track on what's likely coming in the next big stable release, like 26.04 LTS, you absolutely have to look at what 25.10 is doing right now. It's the laboratory, you know, yeah. where they try things out, see what works, what breaks. Got it. So our mission for this deep dive is kind of like decoding that prophecy. We want to dissect Oracular Oriole, look at the key tech changes, the kernel, the desktop, the whole snap thing, and figure out what's real progress versus maybe just hype. And ultimately, help you decide if this version is actually something you should install now or if you're better off waiting. Okay, let's dive in. Where do we start? The absolute core, I guess. Makes sense. The foundation. Ubuntu 25 Donlins is shipping with a new Linux kernel, likely version 6.1, maybe even a bit higher by release. Right, the kernel. Now, for a lot of users, that version number might just seem like, well, a number, but it's more important than that, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, especially if you've got fairly new hardware. Honestly, this kernel upgrade alone could be the biggest single reason to jump on 25.10 early. Why is that? I mean, don't older versions eventually get support for new chips anyway through updates? They do, yes, but it's often backported support. It might not be as uh, natively integrated or fully optimized from day one. Kernel 6.1 comes with much better inherent support for the latest silicon. So we're talking the newest CPUs, GPUs. Exactly. Latest generation AMD and Intel graphics, for instance. New motherboard chipsets, different peripherals, stuff that needs specific drivers. If you bought a PC or laptop in, say, the last six months, chances are 25-point den will just work better with it straight away compared to an older LTS. Okay, better compatibility. That makes sense. But you also mentioned efficiency, right? Something about power management. Yes, that's a big one. We're well into the era of these hybrid processors now, you know, Intel's P cores and E cores, that kind of thing. Right, the performance and efficiency cores. Yeah. And kernel 6.12 is, well smarter about how Linux handles power on those chips. It's better at shifting tasks around, putting cores to sleep when they're not needed. And that actually makes a difference to battery life. It seems so. Some studies looking at these kinds of kernel optimizations suggest maybe 5 to 10% gains in battery duration, especially in lighter use cases like idle or web browsing. Wow, 5-10% is definitely not nothing. You don't really see the kernel, but you'd feel that extra battery. You really would. And the other side of the coin is um, just speed responsiveness. How so? Well, the kernel developers are always tinkering under the hood. Optimizing file systems, how memory is managed, I.O. scheduling, it all adds up. It might be subtle things, but applications might start a fraction faster. Boot time might shave off a second or two. The whole system just feels a bit tighter, snappier. Okay, so a more robust, potentially more efficient and snappier foundation with kernel 6.12. Makes sense. But let's move up a layer to what people actually interact with day to day, the desktop environment. GNOE 48 is the star here, right? That's right, GNOE 48. And it's more evolution than revolution this time around. Think refinement, polishing the existing experience rather than, you know, huge dramatic changes. What's the headline feature then in terms of user experience? I'd say the main thing for productivity is probably the activity search, the global search function. It's getting smarter. Smarter how? It already searches apps and files pretty well. True but now it integrates better with online accounts and other applications. So if you connect, say, your Google account or Microsoft 365 account, you might need to install some extra bits for that. You can search your emails or cloud drive files or maybe even contacts right from that main search bar. Ah, so instead of opening Gmail or files, you just hit the super key and type. Exactly. It's all about reducing steps, fewer clicks, less context switching. It makes the whole workflow feel smoother, more productive. It's a classic UX principle, really. Makes sense. And I saw something mentioned about accessibility being a big focus in Genome 48, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. Genome has really made accessibility a core pillar, and 48 continues that. They're trying to be the benchmark, honestly. What kind of improvements are we talking about? Well, specific things like major updates to the Orca screen reader, making it more reliable for visually impaired users, improvements to the Zoom magnifier tool, better high contrast modes. They're also really focusing on sticking to international standards. 
like WCAG. WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. That's the one. And being compliant with that kind of standard is actually really important. It means GNL Me, and therefore Ubuntu, becomes a much more viable option for big organizations, schools, governments, huh. places that require certified accessibility. It's not just a nice to have anymore. Right. It elevates Linux in those professional contexts. Plus, you get the usual visual tweaks, I assume, smoother animations, that sort of thing. Yeah, the general fit and finish continues to improve. Little things, smoother transitions, maybe more consistency in dark mode. The yeah. stuff that just makes it feel more polished and, well, pleasant to use every day. Okay, so a refined Geonomi experience now. Let's wade into the trickier waters. Application packaging. This seems to be where Ubuntu 25.10 is really uh, pushing the envelope or maybe pushing some buttons. DEBs versus snaps. Yeah, you could say that. This is definitely the um, the main point of contention in the community, isn't it? And 25.10 seems to be doubling down on canonical strategy. More default apps shipping only as snaps. Firefox being the classic example people point to. Often, yes. Canonical's argument is pretty consistent. It's about security and manageability. Okay, let's unpack that. The security argument is the sandboxing, right? Mm -hmm. Isolating the app. Primarily, yes. The idea is that a snap application is confined. It can't easily access parts of your system. It shouldn't. So if there's a vulnerability or even a malicious app somehow, the potential damage is limited. That's the theory. And the manageability. That comes down to updates. Automatic, reliable updates push centrally. And, crucially, the rollback feature. If a snap update causes problems, you can instantly revert to the previous version. That's actually a pretty powerful feature for stability. Okay, I get the arguments for it. But the pushback, especially for more technical users, has always been there. Performance issues, particularly startup times, have been a huge complaint for years. Is 25.10 actually fixing that? That seems to be the big focus for Canonical this cycle. They know they have to address the performance perception, especially the cold start lag that first time you launch a snap after booting up. So what are they doing technically? They're apparently investing quite a bit in things like better caching strategies, maybe different compression for the snap packages themselves, trying to make sure that common libraries and runtimes needed by snaps are loaded more efficiently, cached more aggressively, so they don't have to be you know, initialized from scratch every single time. Right, reducing that initial overhead. Exactly. The goal isn't necessarily to make a cold start identical to a native DEB package that might be technically very difficult, but to make it close enough that most users don't notice it after the very first launch. So 25.10 is the big test for whether those optimizations actually work in the real world. I think so, yeah. If users still report significant sluggishness with snaps in 25.10, that's going to be a major problem for Canonical heading towards the next LTS. They're definitely betting on the tech improvements landing well this time. It's a high stakes bet, for sure. Okay, let's shift gears a bit. Looking towards the future, the oracular part, yeah. what about the more experimental stuff? AI, cloud integration, what's happening there? All right, this is more about laying groundwork, especially for developers. You're not gonna find like a built-in AI assistant yet. Okay, thankfully maybe. Huh, perhaps. <laughs> But what Ubuntu is doing is making it easier to use AI tools. They're focusing on better integration and optimization for the big machine learning libraries. Think TensorFlow, PyTorch, right in the standard Ubuntu repositories. What does that mean practically for a developer wanting to dabble in AI? It means less friction, <laughs> a lot less friction. Mm. Instead of spending hours battling dependencies, compiling things, configuring C day drivers, you can hopefully just install the optimized packages Ubuntu provides and get started much faster. So it's lowering the barrier to entry for ML development on the Linux desktop. Precisely. Making your Ubuntu machine a more viable out of the box platform for experimenting with machine learning, using your GPU potentially without all the setup hassle. And how does the cloud integration piece fit in? Ubuntu is already huge in the cloud. It is, but this is about bringing some of that cloud native tech down to the individual developer's machine. They're strengthening tools like Multipass for quick virtual machines and especially MicroGates. MicroK8s, that's the lightweight Kubernetes. Exactly. It lets you spin up a small, fully functional Kubernetes cluster right on your laptop, literally in minutes. No complex setup needed. Why would a developer want that locally? Well, if you're building applications designed to run in containers, maybe deployed using Kubernetes in the cloud, you need a way to test that whole setup locally before you push it live. Micro K8s gives you that realistic test environment on your own machine. It's like having a mini cloud on your desk. Democratizing container tech, basically. That's a good way to put it. Making these powerful but sometimes complex technologies accessible to more people.
Okay, so the prophecy of 25.10 seems to be a faster, smoother desktop, increasingly built on snaps, but also becoming a much more capable platform for developers working with AI and cloud technologies. Right, we've covered a lot of ground. Let's bring it home. The big question. Should you, the listener, actually update to Ubuntu 25.10? Okay, the recommendation really depends on who you are and what you need. I'd say uh, definitely consider updating if you're an enthusiast and early adopter type, or if you just bought brand new hardware that kernel 6.12 support could be really valuable. De developers too, right? Based on the AI and micro K8 stuff. Absolutely. Developers needing those latest libraries or the easy container testing, yes. And also importantly, anyone who wants to help. If you're willing to find bugs, report them, and help polish things for the next LTS, then using 25.10 is a great way to contribute. Okay, so that's the S camp. Who should definitely hold off? The big warning is for anyone who absolutely prioritizes stability above all else. If the machine you're thinking of updating is your main work computer, the one you rely on daily, the one that cannot afford unexpected glitches or incompatibilities, then no. Stick with the current LTS. Stick with the LTS, or maybe wait a few weeks after 25.2 releases to see how things shake out. But really, non-LTS releases are testing grounds. Things might break occasionally. If you can't tolerate that risk, wait for 26.04 LTS next year. That's what it's designed for. Clear advice. Okay, last thoughts then. Looking ahead, what are the biggest hurdles Oracular Oriole needs to clear in the coming months for this whole vision to succeed? I see three main challenges. First, obviously, is closing that snap acceptance gap we talked about. Right. The performance has to feel good enough for most users this time, otherwise the criticism will just continue to build. Perception matters as much as benchmarks here. Right. Challenge number one, win hearts and minds on snaps. What's two? Competition. Ubuntu isn't operating in a vacuum. You've got Fedora pushing cutting-edge Geonomi, often even faster. You've got Arch for the tinkerers. You've got Linux Mint offering a very polished, more traditional experience. 25.10 is aiming at that enthusiast space, and it needs to offer a compelling, unique reason to choose Ubuntu over those very strong alternatives. It needs its own clear identity and value proposition. Makes sense. And the third challenge. This is maybe a bit more subtle, but it's what I'd call a complexity creep. Ubuntu built its success on being accessible, easy to use. Now it's adding all these powerful layers, snaps, containers, AI tools, cloud integration. Which is great for power users and developers. Exactly, but they need to be careful not to make the core desktop experience feel bloated or overly complicated for the average user. Maintaining that balance between adding power and retaining simplicity is, well, it's really difficult. That's a really tricky tightrope to walk. Mm -hmm. adding features without sacrificing the original appeal. So Oracular Oriole really is more than just another release. It's canonical, showing its hand, laying out its vision for the future Linux desktop faster, maybe more secure through isolation, deeply integrated with cloud and AI tooling. And it forces us, and you the listener, to think about those trade-offs, doesn't it? Yeah. Is this centralized, containerized, cloud-connected future the direction you want the Linux desktop to go? Yeah. Are the benefits worth potentially giving up some simplicity or the traditional package model? Definitely something to ponder, a fascinating glimpse into where things might be heading. Thanks for breaking it all down. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us on this deep dive into Ubuntu 25.10.